it's great to be here and, and I'm really happy to be affiliated uh, with the chamber. They're really a terrific group. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about intergenerational communication conflict, which is perhaps something you've noticed in your, in your organization, for some, perhaps something you've noticed in your daily life. As we understand, as we navigate this time when there are lots of different age groups in the workplace and each different age group has a different way of communicating. And we're gonna to just touch on some things today. So, here's my note. And I can't find the clicker, so there we go. About a year or so ago, I was asked some of my undergraduates, so what do you think my generation thinks of your generation? And a young woman raised her hand and said, they think we all like avocados. <laughs> Still not sure I understand that, but there is something to this whole they think that we're sort of more organic and that we're more in tune with things. Um, and so I've always just, I've kept this slide there because it sort of shows that there's a perception of difference and it doesn't matter if it's from the older to the younger or the younger to the older. But currently there are four generations in the workforce. The traditionalists who were born somewhere between 1922 and 1946. Uh, you have the baby boomers between um, Different sociologists put it at different times, but pretty much, basically it comes down to if your parent or parents fought in World War II, you're a baby boomer. If they didn't, if, your pet, if perhaps it was Korea, you're probably Gen X. So it's difficult really to put a year on it, but the next, the next group are the Gen X, and then there's the Gen Y, the 1980s and above. I know that there are Gen Y people who don't want to be called millennial, they want that moved up. Um, I'm just doing what the sociologists say, but sort of put yourself wherever. And then the students that I'm seeing and the new people entering the workplace now, we don't know what to call them yet. I've heard Generation Z, I've heard the iGen. Uh, certainly digital natives is another term that comes out. People that are entering right now. And they have a whole different way of dealing with, the, with communication. So. This is the age group, so sort of figure out where you may fit in, where your colleagues fit in. For most of today, I'm just gonna divide sort of this group and this group. It's not a perfect division, but when I talk about the older folks, it's these guys. If I talk about the younger folks, it's these people. Um, so we have this sort of idea or this mental image of what these groups look like. Um, I'm not sure it's, Definitely true, but I think we can see the good stereo, some good stereotypes in there. And then I recently found this image of the next generation. But I'm gonna open up, and first of all, if you have any questions along the way, please ask, please interrupt, that's not a problem at all. Um, but what do you see different about this group of people? When you look at them, what do you see? The way that they're dressed and they're tied to their phones. So they're, Casual and connected. I always do the two C's. They're casual and connected. Is there anything else that you see from this group? Very informal. Very informal. Diversity. Diversity, Diversity very diverse. So this is the group that's coming. So a little different than our friends over here. So this is the group that's coming. Okay, so one of the things that we know is that these generational communication differences are a source of diversity. Um, and they're a part of our workplace culture. And it's when we talk about, about communication style, but it really is a difference and it's something that we need to think about, something we need to be aware of. Um, and so if, um, it's just likely that your workplace is experiencing some of this. Like I said, it's possible that your personal life is experiencing some of this. And so I just want to go, like I said, we'll go through a few things. but. Um, the impacts are everywhere. It's communication within your organization and communication with your external stakeholders. It has a lot to do with things like customer service, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, and recruiting. How do you recruit this new generation? How are they gonna find you? How are you gonna find them? So, the question off to you, do you have any of these assumptions? Do you think the younger generation doesn't, just isn't professional enough? Or maybe you think the older generation is too stuffy. Maybe, um, maybe it's okay just to text the response. Or there's that client I have to call. Why do I have to call them? Um, 
<coughs> and maybe we do. So, so I'm going to ask you a trip, sort of a trip down memory lane here. Do you remember when you bought, when you purchased your first smartphone? Everybody remember they purchased their first smartphone? Steve Jobs says, this will change everything. And he was right. <laughs> it has changed everything. Um, remember when you got your first mobile phone? So that was probably your first venture into the idea of having a phone in your pocket and going and suddenly you were connected and we just talked about that a moment ago. So you went from the when I'm out no one can find me to 24-7 accessibility. Do you remember when you added caller ID? How did this change life? And did this change life for the better? Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry? Are. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Depends on whose name shows up there, right? Um, but yes, this was one of those technologies that changed everything because suddenly I didn't have to answer the phone, um, or I knew who I could just say, you know, hello, John Smith. Anybody remember when they just had a landline? Yeah. And how about when you actually dialed the telephone? Eric's heard this before, but my, I worked for the phone company for a while. Um, so my phone trivia for the day when it comes to dialing, do you know how the original area codes were developed and why certain cities had certain area codes? First of all, do you know what an area code is? <laughs> I need to start with that because some of those connected kids don't have a clue. They just know that there are three numbers before another set of three numbers. Um, Area codes were developed by, um, based on the size of the city. And so the larger the city, the smaller the number of the area code. So New York City is 212. One, two, one, two. It was the fastest one to dial. Detroit at that time was one of the larger cities, 313. Chicago, 312. Cleveland, Ohio, where I'm from, 216. So the smaller the number, the larger the city. I used to live in Salt Lake City, Utah. The entire state is 801, <laughs> so it was, you know, 1, 8, oh, nobody calls Utah. So that's your phone trivia for the day. Um, I could also tell you about exchanges, but you don't care about that. <laughs> um, do you remember when you answered the phone no matter what? I had one friend growing up whose family didn't answer the phone. And it used to just sort of drive us nuts because they would just let the phone ring. And if you were at their house, you know, like just scratching a blackboard because they would just let the phone ring. And that was so against the way my family was. Um, and when you introduced yourself, so if I called a friend when I was little, my parents told me, you know, I would call and somebody wouldn't answer. Said, you know, my best friend, hello, Mr. Roth, this is Ken Levine. How are you? Is David home? little speech I went through, which when you think about it, you know, seemed a little silly, but actually taught a lot of phone etiquette, taught a lot of politeness, taught a lot of these things. And of course, I had a friend who never did that. And, you know, he would call and go, is Ken there? And my mom would go, it's Richie. So, you know, there was sort of this negative to if you didn't follow this particular rule. But now we don't do that because this thing tells us who's calling. And so you just sort of answer with, you know, hello, so-and-so. Hello, Richie. Um, so getting back to the workplace, baby boomers were depicted as those people who worked a lot and sacrificed so that they could move up the corporate ladder and they worked 55 to 60 hours a week and all on behalf of the organization. And, um, they like to tell their younger workers about loyalty, about um, giving, you know, working hard, demonstrating your dedication, and patiently waiting for your promotion. Um, and many boomers really embraced this idea of competitiveness in the workplace and focused on um, climbing up that, that corporate ladder. Um, and as adults, 
they really never thought about the term work-life balance. Because when they entered the workforce, there wasn't a phrase work-life balance. <coughs> I'm doing a study right now on paternity leave. No, no father ever asked for paternity leave. It was, you know, the, the, you know, there was a child. You maybe took the day off when the child was born, and maybe you took the day off when the child came home. And that was your paternity leave, and there were no expectations. And maternity leave became an issue as women hit the workforce in the 70s. I mean, it's always been an issue, but it really sort of hit, um, hit organizations in the 70s when women really started to enter the workforce. We had to figure out what to do. Um, so how many of you remember your first email address? How long have you had your first email address? 90s, the 2000s. Another piece of silly trivia, why the at sign? Anybody know why the at sign is in your email address? Well, the internet and email as we know it was developed at MIT, and I used to live in Boston. Um, I know it sounds like I used to live everywhere, but um, when I lived in Boston, they told the MIT, my MIT friends said they did a study and they tried to find the least used key on the keyboard. And the least used key on the keyboard was the at sign. So they figured it wouldn't get in the way of anything and that's actually why it's in your email address. We've now made it a part of the sentence, but it didn't used to be that way. So I found this image not too long ago. This is from 2012, so it's not that long ago, from the BBC on how to write an email. I thought this was great. Um, you know, the address and that you can attach things to an email and you know what the subject is. Type a few words describing the message and then this is where you write the message. And I thought it was funny that in 2012 they were still teaching us how to send emails, but actually I'll talk about it in a minute. This is a big deal. It turns out to be a real big deal. Um, there's, an, there's a blog, uh, a millennial blog writer for Vogue who is quoted as saying, in reality, however, when it comes to navigating the professional world, I'd much rather run naked into a cactus than compose an email. I'm serious. It's an interesting visual. There's truly no greater act of torture than sitting in front of an empty email with the la da unconcerned nature of the millennial generation, but honestly, the whole formality of it seems a bit perverted. So I come, I've come up with this idea of emails, what's expected and what's not, and I just want to spend a few minutes talking a little bit about it because the different generations in the workforce have a real different idea or expectation for what they're going to find in an email. And the boomers want something formal. They want you to start with, you know, dear Ken, or just some <laughs> salutation, hi but not just go straight into the message and the boomers are, I'm sorry, the millennials are quite informal. You know, there's no salutation, they don't sign their emails, they don't address them to you, boom, right into the message. Um, boomers, I mean, I'm the guy, maybe it's because I'm a communica communication professor, but I'm the guy who writes his email in Word, proofreads it, makes sure there are no typos, and then copies it over and sticks it in the email. So maybe I'm a little overboard, but I do like, you know, when my emails are you know, grammatically correct and the words are spelled correctly. And the millennials, the, one, the emails from my students, I have to Google the abbreviations. Because <laughs> I have no idea what they're saying to me. Um, I always think it's, it's really important to know who you're sending it to unless it's a mass email. Um, and as we get to be a more diverse society, there are lots of names that we don't know if they're male names or female names. Um, and that's potentially a problem. Um, we can usually Google the person and find that out, but it's important to know their name and to spell it correctly um, versus, hey, um, not everybody likes, hey, or yo. Um, but it's, you know, we, we know people's email addresses, but we don't know their names. Um, so, and, you know, what, what does CC stand for in, in, an, in an, an email? Cavern copy. Anybody know what a copy really was? <laughs> Anybody remember carbon paper? Um, and BCC, blind carbon copy. 
And my least favorite of all, reply all. I personally, I personally think that person should be tarred and feathered, the person who came up with <laughs> reply all. There are times when it's necessary and times when it's useful. And I like it when someone says, please reply all to this message. But there are many times, or most times, when people reply all for absolutely no apparent reason, other than simply to fill up my inbox with replies. Um, and I don't quite get why. Um, not, at the, not at Michigan State, but I taught at a different university. Um, we had about five people in our college that we nicknamed the reply allers. And they would reply all before I was done reading the message. They would say, so. so we had a pool going as to which one of these five would be first. Kind of now, A, that's not a good use of company time, because then we would email, I got it. Um, and then we would put for the next one. But really, you have to understand that it's, it has a use, but it's not all the time. And understand when it's useful and when it's not. And that's another thing. Um, a lot of the younger generation just reply all to everything versus this idea of seniority and, and, um, and privacy. I don't really know or care what you think or think, you know, that you're thanking the person who did something um, by reply all. Okay, most boomers actually do read the subject line and care about it. Um, and actually I have many friends whose entire email is in the subject line. <laughs> I get, you know, I open up a blank message, but everything I needed to know was in, it's instead of texting, they just send it all in the subject line. Versus just some hi, which doesn't help me a lot in the, in the subject line. I have no idea what they're going to tell me. Um, the idea of thank you notes. Uh, this gets a little uh, strange because most, again, the older people would like a thank you note. Or I should perhaps rephrase this as some sort of closure to the email conversation. So when does the email end? When does this conversation end? Do you have to say thank you at the end or somehow close it? Or do you just sort of let it linger there with the last one that was sent? And for many of the older generation, I always hear that they just want to thank you or a something, a closure message because Email doesn't cost anything. Just send one off that says, you know, I received your email. Because otherwise it's sort of out there in the ether and I don't know if you've received it or read it. So just message received, something like that. And I get the, really? They care? Yes, some people do really care. And since it doesn't cost anything, just acknowledge the receipt of a message. And it's so that it's, because you wouldn't just walk away from a conversation without saying goodbye. Why should you walk away from an email conversation, again, without that closure? Again, a, a generational difference. Um, so this whole idea of, with the response, is it optional, is it not optional? So millennial workers are likely to communicate an interest in flexible career paths. And we find this, one of the fascinating things that we have found tracking our alum in the last five years is that our alums switch jobs really quickly as they enter their new careers, um, the, the recent graduates, where we were told, you know, you've got to stay at your first job at least two years, maybe three, at least. Now we are seeing a whole generation of people who start a job in June and are already on their second job by September. And, you know, it's, uh, we're, it's quite unexpected. We don't quite know what to do with this piece of information. But part of it has to do with what's the flexibility? Can I work from home? How often do I have to come in? What do I have to wear? What is the formality of the workplace? We're seeing all sorts of things coming into this idea of flexibility. Um, millennial written blogs and popular press articles freely admit that there's this whole different take on what it means to go to work. Um, and they, that they priority, prioritize, I'm sorry, close relationships over their career. So compare that to what I was just saying about the older generation to the younger generation. You see a very different mindset in the workplace. So if you are a, a baby boomer supervisor, um, 
maybe, again, you start questioning some of the issues with the younger generation. So again, if, so I just hired somebody who graduated from college in May, took a job, I'm their second job, it's October, am I gonna question their dedication to the organization? How am I going to deal with that? How am I gonna communicate with them to have them want to stay at organization number two within that first year? Or they may just dismiss the millennials as selfish and lazy, which is one of the stereotypes that the younger generation has to deal with. I was in New York City about two or three weeks ago. I <laughs> walked by this billboard and I had to take a picture. Um, Prudential Insurance, I'm not, I don't work for Prudential, but they have a huge campaign sort of to, to get the millennials sort of wrapped, um, to sort of annoy them so that they'll get them into, the, into their offices. Kind of interesting, but I do like this billboard. Um, I actually stopped in the middle of New York City in the middle of the street to take a picture. <laughs> um, so do you remember when you opened your first social media account? If, if you've opened a social media account. When did you last post to your social media account? And is it something that you would want your superior to know? And this is a question that comes up a lot. We, we're, we deal with a whole different idea of what a supervisor knows or could possibly know about me. So I always, you know, one of the things I would say to my students is that I'm not going to say I didn't go out and do a stupid thing on a Friday night when I was in college or soon thereafter. But the only people that know what I did were the people I was with. And now, thanks to Facebook Live, everyone could possibly know what it is that I did on a Friday night. Do, do I want my boss to know that? Do I want my boss to be my friend on social media? Do I want them to follow me? As a boss, do I want to follow my, my employees? I'm getting some really interesting, <laughs> and we'll talk about this, but this is a big question. How much do we want our superiors to know, even though we're all very apt to just disclose all this information. Um, so we know that there's this big difference between what what means to different groups of people. Um, and so like I said, do I want my colleague to know what I did? What's private now? How do you define what's private? <laughs> Um, and we, what we're learning is that all of you, all of us sitting in this room, now have a very different definition of what's private. Um, how much do you post? What do you post pictures of? Do you post? All of that helps decide what our definition of privacy is. And it's not a judgmental thing, but it is something that, you know, we've thought about in some way or another. And, and we have to remember that we are sharing all of this with whoever happens to be following us on social media. So we're also getting into some issues of privacy and politeness. I'm just gonna skip, uh, I thought I actually erased this, but real quickly, there's a 35 year old British blogger, and I have a couple slides, but quickly I'll just tell you, he posted something that from, a, in retrospect, he didn't want to have posted, um, or he didn't want his family to know about, but of course, as he says, my aunt was following me. And so she told everybody, she, she forwarded it off to everybody. And he said, no, oh, it's okay, I've been the black sheep of my family my whole life, nobody really cares. But he does say at the end, it serves as a reminder that the audience you intend may, to see your stuff may not be the audience that takes note of it. And that's something we try to, to tell the students a lot. Um, remember what's on there. The president of the Ohio State University a couple years ago at commencement suggested to all the students that they go home and sanitize their Facebook page. Um, I thought that was an interesting commencement speech. So. Hey Siri. What's the temperature outside? It's 24 degrees outside. Okay. We all know how to do that. Excuse me, Siri. Are you busy, Siri? Anything that might be perceived as polite, 
And not that I need to be polite to my iPhone. But it is a change in the way we're communicating and as I don't have any of these devices at home, but if you have any of these devices at home, Alexas or whatever they're at, how do you speak to them? And how is that way of speaking to our machines bleeding over to the way we speak to people? And especially people we don't know. So for instance, when we're in a store, are we thinking that, that, that the cashier is not all that different than Siri? And are we communicating with strangers in the way we communicate with our iPhone? So when did you send your last text? Has it been over 15 minutes? <laughs> I joke with the students that this posture, when you're sitting at, at, you know, at a desk, that if there's only one reason you're looking like that. They're going, how do you know we're texting? Because there's only one reason you would be in that posture. I know when, it's not that hard for public speakers to know when people are texting. It's fine. But what I, you know, you can't really see it, but this text is a great example of text speak. So this is to Phil, Tim, and Johnny. Let's do Taco Tuesday on Wednesday. Johnny, you're in charge of beer. Phil, you're, f you're famous salsa. Tim, make your fabulous lava cake for dessert. Typical text. But what's different about this text than if there had been a phone call? This is much quicker. This is much quicker. Yeah, I don't have to deal with the, hey, how's it going? And the small talk part. But what else, which is exactly right, and that's what a lot of people like texts for, because I gets rid of all that. But what else is this? Can you think, and any other? Th Multiple parties can well, at the same time. Yep, I get, it's very, it's very efficient. You're not asking. That's just saying. Yeah. You leave no room for negotiations. Exactly. It's very directive. Mm -hmm. And texts text are very much, whoever sends the first one is in charge. Mm -hmm. And do you think any of these people are gonna write back, oh, you know, I really don't wanna get the beer. Probably not. And they're probably they either, they either going to say great or, you know, or I can't make it. But is there going to be a negotiation about? Is there going to be a chat about things? You know, maybe they want to make guacamole. Um, no. So we've become much like asking Siri the temperature. Our texts are very straightforward, but they're not an invitation to a conversation. They're not like a phone call or even an email. Each, each time, so as I've taken you through the phone and then the e email and now the text, what I want you to start thinking about is phone call was a lot of social, a lot of chatter before you got to the message, before you got to the, the main theme. And then the email, again, you probably start with, hey, how's it going? And then got into whatever it is you want to talk about. And then there was a back and forth. And now with text, we're straight to the point. Even though, again, as I joke, doesn't cost by the word. <laughs> you can write an extremely long text. They're all the same. They all, you know, they're used to. Used to, right. Quite a lot. Well, used to, not by the word, but by the text. Um, An email is never cost by the word, but in the old days, they, you <coughs> were charged for email. But you can send a really long text. And it'll just, even, even when we charge for it. Um, but yeah, it's different. Um, so we have changed the way we communicate, just our, all of us. So think about the choice you make. When, when you make a choice to, to, to call, to email, to text, is it based on what your mood is? Or is it based on what the subject matter is? Is it based on the recipient? How do you make this decision? And one of the things we know is that the younger generation has made the, this as their primary mode of conversation or of communication. So there's less give and take. There's less of this idea of having, sitting down having a conversation. You know, why does whoever this is, why does he get to decide, he or she, that Taco Tuesday is gonna be on Wednesday? What if the other people are busy on Wednesday? That doesn't come out. Yes, it's efficient, 
But I just want you to think about the difference. And I know all of you do actually think about should I call, text, or email. But I'm not sure you've thought you know, about how it's taken by the other side. So that when I receive a text that says Taco Tuesdays on Wednesday, it's like, okay, so my, my plans are all screwed up now. Because we took such a directive, the senders took such a directive approach. So millennials um, sometimes feel very marginalized by, um, by their older, more senior employees. And that makes it more difficult for them to fit into the organizational culture. Um, and one of the things we know is that this lack of being a part of the culture is negatively related to satisfaction. And hence, low levels of communication support is associated with higher levels of turnover. And since this generation has no qualms with turnover anyway, this sort of exacerbates the point. Um, so just a little bit about customer service. Um, when younger customers interact with brands, um, they want to feel that, they're, that, they're intera sorry, that their interaction is somewhat authentic. Um, according to Accenture, younger customers expect the brands they like and follow to be active participants in their online and live conversations. And responding quickly is incredibly important. Millennials like self-service, baby boomers like customer service. So when you're at Meijer or anywhere, I, one of the, I always look to see who's at the self-checkout line and who's at the old-fashioned checkout line with the cashier. Um, and not that all older people, that there are never any of the older people at the self-checkout, but very <laughs> seldom are there really young people at the traditional checkout with the cashier. Um, have you ever wondered why? Well, it goes back to this quick and directive, and they don't want to have a conversation about, did you find everything you needed, and all the other things that go along with it. So having grown up with the internet, they're used to hunting for information by themselves. Um, and whenever they have problems with an organizational website, they don't go to the organization. They first they go to an FAQ page. Then, then they'll Google for a community forum that tells them how to do something. Um, I, just, I just had a little issue with Amazon. Um, and it was fascinating because there's no customer service telephone number on the Amazon web page. I had to Google, had to ask, you know, to Google the Amazon customer care number. I bought something for $12. It was the wrong thing. I returned it. It cost me $5 to send it back. And then it cost $7 to restock it. <laughs> and so I received an email that I got a dollar two refund on my product. And so I called them and said, if I would have bought something for $11, would it have cost me money to return it? They gave me the restocking feedback. Um, but we're also finding that, the, um, that people don't call. And I think I probably got the restocking feedback because I called. Mm -hmm. um, because I initiated a conversation rather than sent an email. Um, so baby boomers typically want someone on the phone without too many prompts to get there um, to assist them. So we, organizations are stuck sort of between a rock and a hard place right now. They need the online presence. They need the person presence. They need everything because different different constituencies, different customer base want different things. And we can't not have what our customers want. So it's important for our organizations to understand that they have to have both of these things going on at the same time. Um, according to desk.com, 25% of millennials expect to get a response from a text or email within 10 minutes. Um, so millennials want it fast and baby boomers want it right. Baby boomers are happy to wait a little bit longer to get the correct answer. So sometimes millennials will just get a text back, I don't know. But at least it came within 10 minutes. So then it gives a longer period of time. I'll tell you, on my syllabi, I now write that I have 24 hours to get back to them because I received negative feedback because I didn't respond to an email within 10 minutes. Um, because there's just this expectation that I'm sitting here during dinner waiting for a student to email me. And my students are terrific. But during dinner, I'm not <laughs> waiting for them to email me. Um, again, millennials prefer text messaging over phone calls. Not all baby boomers feel the same way. 
Um, if it's instant and mobile, um, it allows them to respond quickly. We like that, you know, everybody likes that part. But how does your organization want to deal with this? Um, so, you know, I can think of a lot of organizations that text me um, or organizations that send me emails that a product is ready. Amazon always tells me when my package has arrived now. Um, how, how do your customers want to get this information? Do your customers want to get this information? So something you have to figure out in your own organization, um, you know, if, if, it's, if you're a service organization and you're coming to my house, do, a, do I want to know that you're expected between 9 and noon? Or do I want you to call me and say, I'm on my way, I'm on the street, I'll be there in 10 minutes. How are you going to deal with that? How are we changing? The, the expectations. Um, so one of the things we have to do is we have to train. We really have to train both generations to work with the other. Generations are pretty good at working among themselves, but it's this between. And, you know, for instance, so we have to train younger, the younger employees to take some initiative because young, older customers still want some customer service. Um, they don't want to have to come and ask, can you help me? Um, or where do I check out? Um, so the younger generation has got to understand that you need to engage in a conversation. Can I help you? What can I help you with? Um, and that's a big, a big training issue that we're dealing with right now. Again, they're not used to engaging in small talk. They didn't grow up with it. They text. So they're not used to engaging in, in small talk and with these types of conversations that the older generation, who may be your customers, want. So there's a lot of training that needs to be done. Um, and this is a really funny one, but I hear this all the time. The, w no problem is not the correct answer to thank you. <laughs> um, and I don't know why, but this really bugs a lot of people I know, and I get this all the time that no problem is not the response. If I say thank you, it should be you're welcome and not no problem. I don't know exactly why that's got people so annoyed, but it does. Yeah? In Spanish, when someone says um, uh, gracias, you say de nada, which means it's nothing. Correct. Um, but we're not, you know, if I were speaking Spanish, that would be better. Um, that, it's just a, it's, it's a cultural thing. Because yep. um, in French it's the same thing, de rien. Yep. Um, but in the United States, in English, I say in English, not in the United States, in, in English, all languages are very, all languages are different. I could spend a whole hour on that one, um, talking about how our language is developed. <laughs> but um, the Romance languages have a different way of dealing with this. But I don't, again, I've had so many people complain to me about no problem. When I take my little, when I give surveys, that it's, I include it now because it's just, it must really be a thing. Because <laughs> it really annoys some people. Um, and like, of course, always annoys some people. So if generation, if intergenerational communication conflict is too much of an issue in your workplace, um, employees begin to think that their job isn't safe and that no career is assured. Because again, there's no communication. If people are not, able to communicate well between other members of their, of their own organization because of all the things I've talked about. Um, there's just this feeling that I don't fit in. And if I don't fit in, I'm not safe here. <coughs> and it's, it's a safe in terms of keeping my job. Um, we know, just, this is just human nature, we are likely going to be friendlier with people around our own age. That's just, that's just human nature. So we begin to have these little cliques of people of different age groups. And they blame, of course, the people in all the other age groups. So one of the things that organizations need to do is to break the cliques up and to engage in social time within the organization to make sure that people interact. And you know, talking about other cultures, the Brits do this really well when they have tea time. Get everybody into a room at 10 and a 3, they give them a cup of tea and a biscuit, and everybody chats for 15 minutes. And we know that the British culture is very hierarchical. But for those 15 minutes, everybody's equal in the room. 
And then they go back and they're unequal and they go back to real life. But for 15 minutes, they have a moment, they have a time to break this stuff up and to interact and to learn how to do it. Um, so, um, some suggestions is to, again, start thinking about how communication works in your workplace. Um, one of the things I always say, and I, again, something I tell the students a lot, talking to your colleague is not like talking to your friend. And that goes back to some of our social media issues where they know much more about us, our colleagues know much more about us than perhaps our colleagues did if you've been in the workplace for 20, 30, 40 years. How much did your colleagues know about you when you started? How much could they find out about you? Could they Google you? Could they, you know, could they be friends with you? Or did they just know what you told them? Um, and so you still, even though all this stuff's out there, you still have to remember that there should be a separation between your colleagues and your friends. Not all of them, but some of them. Because I'm going to guess that most everybody in this room has had a colleague that perhaps undermined something that they did. And that's because you told them something that you would have told a friend. And so it's an important lesson that we now know is even more important thanks to the world of, of social media. Um, but, all commu but communication plays this major role in all of our daily lives. And again, we, we have some real differences. So when I'm the sender of a message like I am right now, how am I communicating as, as compared to anybody else of my age group? How am I communicating as a member of a different age group? What can I do to eliminate these barriers that I may have with communicating with someone who's 10, 20 years older than I am to 10, 20 years younger than I am? Um, we, we, interpersonally, we all have these issues, but what can I do in the workplace to get rid of it? Um, how do I think my message is being received? So go back to that text message example. Is my, am I being just really directive? Am I speaking in text? And that's sort of the new phenomena. We are speaking in texts. We are not speaking in emails. We are speaking in letters. We're not speaking in phone calls. We're speaking in text. And that comes to how, am I, how is my message being received? Um, and then try to think to myself, how might somebody else communicate this to me? Um, place myself into the role of the other person. What questions can I answer? I didn't see any like emojis or pictures in any of your posts, and so I, I just feel like when I was especially reading that text about the tacos, I would have never typed that. I would have just put a little taco right there. So I'm wondering <laughs> where you see that going. Um, and you're right. Thank you for pointing out that I didn't have any emojis. Because, um, again, I never use them. Um, <laughs> it's, you know, it's funny because the first thing I think of, it, I, I have a friend who's, basically texts me in all emojis. And we must not agree on what one of them means. Because <laughs> there's this one he sends a lot, and I think it's rude. I mean, I, I, and I, he can't think that, because it, it doesn't fit into the sentence. Uh, but I think, anyhow, there's, there is a problem that they're not always understood the same way. Um, I was giving a talk similar to this recently to um, the big organization in town, and there was somebody who said that she puts a lot of ex exclamation points on her texts, and was that good or bad? And I said, well, what does your superior say when you text your superior with 25 exclamation points? And she looked over to her superior, and I didn't go any further than that, but um, again, it's the, way it's, it's the way it's received. And so I don't use emojis because, basically because of this experience I have with my friend, that I don't get it. And I'm, you know, it's gone on long enough that I'm embarrassed to say, what do you think this emoji means? <laughs> because I don't think it means <laughs> what you th obviously think it means. So a smiley face is a smiley face, and a taco is a taco. But there are some that are a little bit less. So I would, I would, I would say be careful. Um, it was my only suggestion. And make sure that everyone knows it's a taco. 
<laughs> the only thing I would say, just make sure that everybody knows it's a DACA. That makes sense? Yeah, I was just curious your thoughts on it. Yeah. Yeah, to me it's about, under, it's about um, I, I want to make sure my message is understood. That's, to me that's the essence of what I do. Yeah? I was just going to point out, um, I have an Android point, but my mom has an iPhone, and sometimes when I text her things or she texts me things, the icons don't come through and they'll just come like a blank box or a question mark or something. So I have kind of have to watch that because it depends on which platform you're on. Sometimes they don't come through, period, or they're really weird. I, um, my car reads my emails for me. Reads my, I'm sorry, reads my texts for me. And it's really funny when it gets to the smiley face emoji. Because um, that's what it says to me. You know, you know see you on Thursday, smiley face emoji. Um, so I, actually, I should have my car read the text from the guy that I don't understand. And see what, <laughs> see what my car thinks this guy is telling me. What other questions can I answer? I yeah. have a question about Snapchat. I noticed you didn't touch on that a lot, and I feel like with a, a house full of millennials, you know, Gen, Gen X, <laughs> Gen Z, you know, whatever they are. I, I run the gamut with, with all my children, and that seems to be a, a, huge, um, a huge platform right now for their communication. And you're right, you know, when you said about the response so quickly, they, they're so connected to it, literally right in their face, that it's just a constant, hey, 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 here I am with my face, and here I am with my hood over my face. And, you know, it's just really weird. I don't know if anyone else has that happening in their house, but yeah. And here's what I'm having for breakfast. Yeah, exactly. I used, yeah. For, I, I've never understood why people text me food, pictures of food, or, or post pictures of food. Um, it's been my own little pet peeve since they started doing that. Like, I really don't care. Um, but this is, an, this is a great example of a platform that makes perfect sense f for that particular generation. And there's actually an upper limit of like 28 where you don't understand that platform or that platform just doesn't work for you. Um, and again, we just have to figure out how am I going to interact with it if I have to um, is it going to make a difference in my organization? And if it does, then I have to figure it out. If my demographic has, the, has a population then I, of Snapchat users, then I, have, then I have to incorporate it. And that's why you hire 22-year-olds um, to do that. Because they, they're putting me in charge of Snapchat would you know, not be beneficial. Um, you have to understand what the receiver is expecting to get. So why, why am I sending a picture of me with a hood on, me with, you know, and, and why is the receiver, why does the receiver care? Um, what is the receiver getting out of this message? And when we figure that out, when we start to understand the, um, the, the receipt of that message, I mean, if you go back, wasn't it nice when you actually got a letter in the mail? Wasn't it nice when, you've got an, when you received an email from a note, out, somebody out of the blue? You know, maybe it was, wasn't it nice when somebody you hadn't thought of in years friended you on Facebook? All of these things were, you know, nice. Now, somehow, we have to get that same feeling of niceness communicated through different platforms. Uh, and, we, and it only works if we're dealing with people who understand the platform. So you say that it might be ideal to get the millennials in to manage the social media accounts because they just get it. Are there certain pieces of the workplace that you think the baby boomers or traditionalists will always excel versus millennials? Um, the, the, I would, well, first of all, if you've been working in the same field for a long time, you're just going to have expertise. And most older folks are happy to share their expertise with you. Um, and that's the part, the institutional memory. Um, if somebody's worked, we don't have people long anymore, but people with institutional memory can really help the organization succeed. Because we know what happened in the past, what worked and what didn't. And so there's always going to be need for people who've been through, through the ringers, through good times and bad. Um, and again, who know how to do the job. Um, 
The way we do the job may be different, but the job themselves haven't changed too much. So the attorney, the person with the, the law firm in the back of the room, I practiced law for, I practiced law before I went back to, to, to graduate school. Um, I'll just real quickly, my, um, the very beginning I was assigned a legal secretary um, who was 80. And I remember she was 80 because like a, a, one, a couple of months into my tenure at the law firm, she, for her 80th birthday, went river rafting in Alaska. So she's not your typical 80 year old. She was amazing, her name was Dorothy. She was a scream. But I dictated my first letter, gave it to Dorothy to type it up, and the letter came back, and I looked at the letter, and there was nothing that I had dictated other than the address that was in the body of the letter. <laughs> and I realized that my letter was lousy and her letter was perfect. And I learned how to practice law thanks to Dorothy. I knew law from law school, but I learned how to practice law from Dorothy. And she taught me everything about the correct way to interact with the opposing counsel, the correct way to file a pleading. That's the stuff that the older generation likes to do, wants to do, and is necessary to do. Yeah? Is there a term like ethnocentrism where people view their, you know, their culture as better than somebody else's culture, a term that's used for generations where I see my generation as better than your generation and therefore I respond to you differently? That's a really good question. I don't know that there's a term. I just know that, there is, that it is. Um, and I don't know that it's better, but it's certainly different. I mean, I understand that you're different. And when I look at generations either above me or below me, I, I can roll my eyes either direction. Um, so we always think that we're right. And that we're, you know, and again, I've been a professor now for 20 years. Um, so I'm going to think that I'm doing it correctly, but my new colleagues are probably doing it very differently. And are the students getting more out of my class or out of their class? And I don't know that answer. But uh, there isn't a term, but there is this belief that, come on, I'm doing it right. And they're, not, and they're all nuts. Right. <laughs> so that, I mean, just, yeah. it was over the age of 55, and I uh, am under 30. And so merging those teams and those cultures is you know, quite the challenge, and we're experiencing uh, all of that. And I definitely feel a large part of the tension is just different agreements on what's the best practices of uh, like each other's generations. And I just didn't know if that was something that... Was I mean, I'm going to guess that the organization that, you're, that, was, that was acquired, first of all, this is from a whole different standpoint. There's a huge um, issue when you are acquired. So you have an existing organizational culture and you are now being brought into somebody else's culture and that makes you feel like your culture was, was somehow wrong. And so you have to sort of deal, let these people deal and mourn the loss of their culture. And that's an issue that M&As forget. That there's, you're, you've brought, you know, you've made these people leave something that they liked. Um, so you've got that, you've also got that going on. That's a whole other part of this equation. But, you know, they, they're used to doing things their way. They're used to communicating. I bet they have conferences and they sit around and chat about things. Heaven, heaven forbid they sit around and chat. And you're under 30, you don't sit around and chat as much. So right there, you just have a difference. Not better or worse, just different. But yeah, let them, by the way, let them mourn. The loss of their culture. That's a big insight there. Cause it's like, why are, you, <laughs> are you, why are you venting and complaining to me? Like, it, not, not seeing that as a mourning process it would be beneficial, or seeing it as a mourning yeah. process would be beneficial. Um, yeah, I mean, I can talk to you more, but there's a whole pro there are ways to do this um, that are really important to do to make sure that this, that something can grow out of the new organization. I'd love to have that conversation. The person behind you, I think, had their hand up. I was just curious if there's particular Michigan organizations that you think have done a really good job in the communications front of melding the generations. Uh, and it is, I heard a, a, somewhere that it's now the platinum room. It's not treat others the way you want to be treated. It's treat them the way they want to be treated. Mm -hmm. And how you know companies that have managed to capture that and roll that out in the organization. Um, I don't, I'm not going to, uh, partly because I don't know who's in the room, um, the organizations uh, that, you're, that you're a part of, but 
Um, there are a couple of high tech companies in this town that I've uh, been, that I've had the opportunity to observe <coughs> that really uh, have created e exciting workplaces by partially architecture, partially um, just having people understand the importance of um, of communicating. And in fact, I was talking to Eric, and they created a space in the back there, sort of a we share kind of space. Um, and that's doing a lot to help, you know, the older folks, are, you know, want their office. And of course, aspire to the corner office. And the younger folks aspire to a laptop at some hipster coffee shop down the street. Um, I didn't even talk about that whole difference. Um, but how do we get the person you know, who wants to be in, my students have told me there's a coffee shop that's way too hip for me, I shouldn't ever go, and it's somewhere around here. Um, I don't, yeah, I'm, 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 they've like forbidden me to go. Um, I'm sorry? No offense to you, but yeah, strange man. Yeah, it, that's the end, and yeah, they've said if they ever see me there, they won't talk to me. Um, so, but, you know, I know that there's a culture of, of people who want to spend their day there, or Panera or Grand Traverse Pie, which is where I would go. Um, and then, but when I was growing up, I aspired to going to an office and having, you know, and then or going to a workplace and then getting an office and then having a window. And they're just not the same aspirations anymore. Um, and so the companies that have figured out how to um, give people the flexibility. So if I want an office, I can have one. If I don't want an office, I don't need one. Um, yet we still come together occasionally and have the conversations that we need. The companies that are not doing well, in my opinion, are the ones that have gone you know, all one direction or all the other. Um, and the ones that are all virtual are having, continue to have issues because they're never in the same room. They never share ideas. They don't even know who their colleagues are. Um, and, you know, if you're, if you're hired into a company that has no physical location, that's one thing, but if you had one and it went away, that's a, a sort of a real problem. So the companies that are doing well have figured out how to navigate these waters where sometimes you do need to be here and sometimes you can be where you want to be. Does that help? What, other, what else can I answer? Yeah. Um, so. Along those lines, are we making a bigger deal of this than it is? Isn't, is there ever a history of a generation saying, oh yeah, these, this younger generation's really got it together, they're doing it way better than us. Um, and historically, historically is this that different than any other position that we've been in as far as generational difference? Um, thank you for asking that. Yes, um, this, this is different because this is different. Um, and the expectation, so I will, you know, when the, tradi when, the tr when the baby boomers came in, the traditionalists said the same thing, but they all communicated the same way, by phone or by letter. Um, but when, and when the Gen X's first came in, you know, I remember teaching, I remember teaching somebody what a fax machine was. I remember getting the first fax machine and explaining it as, you think of it as a copy machine where the other copy is on the other end of the phone line. It's the communication technology that's changed so much and it's changing so dramatically. So my, what I was trying to point out is that we communicate differently now. And we were different generationally for the, you know, for millennia, no pun intended with the millennials, but we've always been different. But communication had always stayed the same. And now communication is changing. And so I get, so now we do have a problem because when I speak to a 22 year old, he or she communicates and expects me to communicate in a different way. So I do think that we are living in a time where the intergenerational issues are more important to, to confront than they used to be. Does that make sense? Yep. And to address that question, this is the first time in history that five generations have been in the workforce. So the conversation is different, how we interact with each other is different. So that's why it's important actually, because we've never had this before. Right. Um, people aren't retiring at 65. Um, people are very happy to continue working. Um, and we're going to have this, 
new generation coming in. And again, it's not that things haven't changed over time, but I, just the way we talk, the way we communicate is dramatically different. And so when you talk to high school students, you talk to college students, you talk to recent grad, or you talk to the 18 to 22 year olds who didn't go to college, they have a different vocabulary, they have a different expectation of interaction. Um, and so there was this picture way back there in the presentation of you know, the two people the, sitting next to each other with earbuds on. When I went to college, heaven knows, um, I can probably count on one hand the number of times I went to the dining hall by myself. Because that would I would have been mortified. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't want anybody to see that I had, it was like, I have no friends. No one, no one would ever go to the dining hall by themselves. And now when I go to the dining halls at MSU, most people are by themselves. And they're watching their phones or their computers. Um, and, and, or they're sitting around a table with five or six other people, but they're not talking. They're texting to each other across the table. Um, so it's just different. Um, than, it, than it used to be. Again, and, and it's not a judgmental thing, but if I, if I know that my employee is perfectly content with earbuds on, by themselves not interacting with me, I have to change my style of management. Because my style of management is walking around and interacting with people and how's your day, what are you working on? That's how, when, I was in a, when I was in a management position, that's how I did it. I kept up with people by small talk, by chatter, by walking in, by meeting them in the coffee room. I can't do that with a generation that doesn't want to talk to me. So I have to figure out a new way to do it. Does that make sense? How can you cater to this new generation by giving them what they want without hurting company morale or stealing offices that are there the people who have been expected to come to work every day? Um, that's a, it's a tough one. Um, you know, it's one of those where you have to say to the older, we have to make, a, you know, if we want the top notch talent, this is what we have to do. And if we, and I think if it's framed in a way of this is what's best for our company, there's less animosity. There's always going to be some animosity, but um, it's got to be framed in this is, the 21st century. It's 2018. It's about to be 2019. And this is the way we have to do it. And most people get that. But it's got to be framed that way. <coughs> I'm back. Yeah, I don't really have a question, but more of a comment. Um, I, you know, for my entire work life, one of the things my colleagues know I say all the time, it's all about expectations. And I think that, you know, what you've been talking about today in these differences, it's just important for everybody to understand first and foremost and then to understand the why. I heard you mention that. But when everybody has a common understanding of what the expectations are, there's less conflict. And that's not just in the workplace, that's in your family, that's in every relationship. A lot. It's just all about relationships. And people are different, like even within your family, you know, you know, my parents, I interacted differently with them than my own children. Uh, you know, so when you learn that, and as an organization, you start to embrace that it's our responsibility to communicate to our employees the why. Why are we doing this? Like you said, it's important for the betterment of the entire company. I think people accept it. Um, the expectation part, I always say, when the conflict, all conflict, always you can look at it and see where there is this uh, expectation that wasn't met on someone's part. And when you can clear it up, when you can ahead of time, I mean, I've worked in a university environment my entire life. I think we're kind of uh, probably have an advantage to uh, corporate America in this regard because I've had to learn all this stuff back in the 90s. You know, that it, you're talking about all these differences. Mm -hmm. You know, I just want to make that comment. I appreciate what you're saying today and uh, listen to everything yeah. you had to say and the advice that you were giving. Well, thank you. And I agree. It is all about relationships and, and navigating them. Um, and that's, you know, that's, that is what will make or break any organization. 
um, and any, any, any other type of uh, interaction. So I couldn't agree more.